it is a wet and unpleasant Sunday morning in central London. I'm going up here to Broadcasting House, BBC Broadcasting House, where I am being interviewed in uh, 10 minutes before they go live to the Senator for the Remembrance Sunday celebrations, a huge national event. So I'm going to be talking about the history of, um, of Whitehall, of uh, Parliament Square, of Trafalgar Square, the Cenotaph itself. So it's, it's quite a big thing. Wish me luck. Catch you on the other side. And then what we'll do is we'll go for a stroll because then this afternoon at three o'clock I'm on BBC London just talking about my book. Um, so in between those two interviews on the BBC, I will do a stroll. Obviously take you with me on that stroll somewhere around here. I've got some ideas actually. I mean, that would be a relief, right? It won't just be aimless stroll. Well, it'd be a little bit aimless, but not completely aimless. Wow, the massive Portland stone edifice of Broadcasting House looms ahead. Of course, there is the wonderful church in front of it. The history and significance of the area goes back a long, long way. To tell us more, the writer, filmmaker and flaneur of London streets, John Rogers, joins us now. Good morning, John. Good morning. How are you? That was a lot of fun. Gives me a real kick to be talking about Druids at Westminster and E.O. Gordon's prehistoric mounds of London <laughs> uh, on national radio, particularly. I mean, that was a, a significant spot as well. That was really, thanks so much to Phil, the producer, who invited me on the show, and the, and the hosts, Jeanette and Amy. They were lovely and made it really easy for me. It was cracking. Oh, anyway. So I'm going to do a walk now, and actually it's Remembrance Sunday, and uh, no, I'm not wearing a poppy, sorry about that. I usually, the poppies don't last long on my jackets, as I'm sure you can imagine, but I should be wearing one really, but I'm going to do, although this video will go, <laughs> will go out next Sunday, the week after, it has prompted me to do, there is a, I want to have a kind of aim for this walk, I kind of want to give it a, a narrative beyond just going for a stroll. So actually there's a photograph I saw yesterday from the big, uh, protests that were yesterday and it links to what I think of on Remembrance Sunday. It's a link to my family. It's a little bit of family story that's commemorated in a statue on the other side of Hyde Park. So that's where we're going to go. It's a good story. I think it's a good story. It's good. It means a lot to me. It's what I think of on Remembrance Sunday anyway. So that's, let's go there. Hang on. You'll, it's kind of interesting. This is Cavendish Square. <laughs> I'm going to take a stab in the dark and say that is, uh, I was going to say it's Lord Cavendish, but I, do you know what, I've got a funny feeling it isn't. Let's go and have a quick look. So this beautiful garden square here was planned in uh, 1717 as part of the Marylebone estate that was owned by Edward Harley, Earl of Oxford and Mortimer. And of course that gives us Oxford Street, Mortimer Street. And it's actually named after his wife, Lady Henrietta Cavendish Holes. And it's through her and through their marriage that he succeeded the manor of Marylebone. And they got married in 1713. So that's interesting. He was like basically following on a trend of garden squares that have been really popular. We've covered most of them, I think, in previous videos. Uh, Hanover Square, I'm not sure it's in a video, but you know, the squares of Bloomsbury were particularly popular. Bloomsbury Square, St. James's Square, etc. So the statue is of William Frederick Cavendish, something else who is a descendant of Edward Harley, the builder of the square. What I find interesting is that plinth there had the, a statue of the Duke of Cumberland on there atop his horse. Now I wonder if that's the, the Duke of Cumberland that was known as the Butcher of Culloden. Quite a controversial figure, even by the standards of his time amongst his fellow countrymen, not just the Scottish. So I wonder if that's why his statue is no longer there. And originally, the Duke of Chandos planned to build the grandest townhouse in Europe here on the north side of the square in, in, in the 1720s. Whether that interfered with the plans for the square or not, I don't know. But he lost so much money in the uh, South Sea bubble, he could only afford to build these two Palladian mansions. Poor chap, only being able to build two Palladian mansions rather than the grandest townhouse in all of Europe. I wish my unsuccessful financial ventures ended like that. 
and this bridge linking the two buildings is actually post-war and above it is a statue by the sculptor Jacob Epstein. It was to uh, mark the site of a convent which was down here, may even still be there. The fifth Duke of Portland lived on the square and much of this part of London that was built around that time, 18th, 19th century, was built of Portland stone, so I guess the link is there. To Regent Street where the um, where I was earlier on at the start of the day becomes Great Portland Street. So Portland, you see all the names, don't you? Mortimer, Mortimer Street, Oxford, Oxford Street, Harley Street, etc. Just the names of wealthy families, really. And in order to incorporate some of the kind of heritage of London into the Athletes' Village in the Olympic Park, they, bit, they incorporated some Portland stone into the buildings there because that is the stone of this and Bloomsbury and all of that. So they were trying to echo that in the new build development just in East Village. A fact mentioned in my book. <laughs> Welcome to New London, journeys and encounters in the post-Olympic sea. Had to get it in there. Oh, come on, I don't know how long this video is by now. It's got a few minutes in. I don't know if I'll shoehorn another one in before the end of the video, but yeah, all the, you know, the books available to purchase from your local bookshop, from that well-known online bookseller. Even, you can even buy it for me signed and I wrap it in tissue paper Put a little Lost By Way sticker on there. Just saying. Cavendish house over there. My audio here is jeopardised by these little kind of group of scooter riders. There was a big load of motorbikes went down Regent Street when I sat at my coffee earlier on. I'm not sure if it's to do with Remembrance Sunday. It looks like those guys are wearing medals, so maybe it is. Motorbikes and Remembrance. Interesting. Never sure with the blue plaques whether there's anyone that you're going to be that interested in. But this is look, Sir Ronald Ross, 1857 to 1932, a Nobel laureate who discovered the mosquito transmission of malaria. He lived here at Cavendish House. So let's go down here, down Wigmore Street, which I really love. This is one of my uh, favourite streets in central London, actually, although I rarely come down here. I love the architecture. It's got a nice kind of feel to it. And in keeping with other place names in the area, Wigmore is associated with uh, the estate of the, the Duke of Portland. It's the name of a village in Herefordshire that they owned that had a castle. And there is the famous concert venue, Wigmore Hall. I've never been to a concert at Wigmore Hall and I've always wanted to go. Famous for classical concerts. And in fact, there's a piano makers along here that used to make the pianos that were, were played at Wigmore Hall, I just read. One day I will go to a concert at Wigmore Hall. Should I go over and buy a ticket now? Number 33 Wigmore Street is a beautiful building, isn't it? It's kind of Art Deco-ish. This is glorious. I'll have to look it up. It's not mentioned on Wikipedia, which is what I'm using. I have got the London Compendium in my bag, but it's really cold. And I am just trying to just go for a stroll, right? It won't come out that clearly on the camera but you can see we're clearly heading down into a, a dip there into a valley and that is the course of the buried river Tyburn the lost river Tyburn one of the great lost rivers of London which I have walked and I will link to that bloke cracking walk which I also did in winter actually funnily enough I always think one of the great sort of paradoxes if that's the correct word is that association between classical music at Wigmore Hall and sort of like things being a bit posh, a bit upper class, a little bit out of reach of ordinary people. Whereas in reality, if you look at the price of tickets at Wigmore Hall, they're under 20 quid. They're sort of around 15, 16, 18 quid per ticket. I think if you go with kids, it's even cheaper. Whereas if you look at the price of a ticket to see a well-known band, rock band or something, I mean, you can pay 100 quid, 120 quid for one of those gigs. Bring in mind, they are like world-leading musicians, world-class world -class musicians playing there. So it's a lot more accessible, actually, than going to see one of your favourite you know, rock or pop bands. You know, so actually, this is where Marylebone Lane here, which is where I stood now. Marylebone Lane, that is where the, uh, the fleet is running along Marylebone Lane and carrying on over there. But that's all in another video that I will, like I say, I'll link to that below. But when the Christmas lights are on in Marylebone Lane, you can see they've already put them up there. It is really 
It's very quaint, very cute and quaint with the Christmas lights. I feel like I have to go down here, down this street here, the name of which isn't jumping into my mind, but again, it's a lovely little street. This is uh, St. Christopher's Place. Looks like a lot of the buildings are quite new and we forget actually this part of London did suffer significant bomb damage during the Second World War. Whether, whether that's why these buildings are quite new or not, I don't know. And this is G's Court on the far side of St. Christopher's Place. Another delightful little passageway. That was, uh, that was a really funny encounter. I, lo I love the things that happen when you go on walks. There was a young lady stood outside that shop back there giving out samples. And she was like, oh, do you want to take my photograph? I was like, well, it's a video, it's YouTube. And then anyway, we got talking and she gave me these samples and then she invited me in to demonstrate this anti-wrinkle cream. So that eye has the anti-wrinkle cream on it. I think it's like a collagen cream. And um, that eye there doesn't. So you can do the, you can, I mean, straight away, you can see a bit of a difference. Come out onto Oxford Street, what's going on? Anyway, so she, <laughs> she sat there putting this wrinkle cream on me and drying it off and chatted me. Eden, thank you Eden for trying to remove the bags from under my eyes. She said it will work better on the, it will look better on the camera. She promised as well that she, if, I was, she's gonna give me a facial and remove all the redness from my nose. So I said, uh, quite proud of the redness on my nose. <laughs> no, I'm not proud of it. It would be good. I would have liked to have, I've never had a facial before. Things that happen to you when you go on a walk. Turning up, turning up James Street here now. Yeah. Love this little street. And encounters like that make me think of one of my favourite London films called The Sandwich Man, and it's a guy's journey. A sandwich man, you know, when they used to have the advertising on a sandwich board, and it's a sandwich board man coming from, I think it's like the uh, Isle of Dogs, I think he is. Isle of Dogs or Canning Town, I can't quite remember. 60s film, and he walks across London to Hyde Park Corner, I think it ends, or he ends up down in Chelsea, somewhere like that. It's a great film anyway. And he, it's his day walking across London with a sandwich board, and he has lots of encounters along the way. This is kind of a similar sort of thing today, a casual stroll across London. Basically got an hour and a half to get to the place I wanted to go today to mark uh, Remembrance Sunday and get back here to go on BBC Radio London uh, uh, just after three o'clock, hour and a half. I think we can do it. Might have to get the tube back, but let's hightail it. The famous Selfridges department store. Very grand place, wonderful at Christmas. Absolutely wonderful at Christmas. So we're gonna pass through Mayfair pretty quickly. We covered some of Mayfair at the beginning of the year, didn't we? When the Christmas lights were still up at the other side of the year, it's quite interesting. This is Duke Street. This is interesting, brown heart gardens, like a, a raised public garden here in a, in, a, in a small, I guess might have been a square. Interesting. It gives us a view into these, uh, well, these look like they might have been actually some form of, I am tempted to say social housing or charitable housing, but in Mayfair, really? Well, that plaque there on the wall does say erected by the Improved Industrial Dwellings Company of 1886, which is uh, predates council housing, but there was a, a move to provide good quality housing for the working people of London in the Victorian era, so maybe that's what it is. Here's the old uh, American Embassy building here on Grosvenor Square. American Embassy now has moved down to Nine Elms, Battersea. And uh, I remember going in that building there to be interviewed for a visa. It's not the world's, <laughs> not the world's best building. But uh, I do, I thought it was interesting that I heard that the US government decided to move their embassy because they hadn't realized the idea of leasehold in this country. They, all they had was a, they bought a lease on the land. They thought they owned the land and they didn't because it's owned by the, um, God, the Duke of Westminster, I think, owns all of this and still owns it, which I think took the American government a little bit by surprise. 
And Grosvenor Square over there, of course, was the, was the scene of many a famous protest, anti-Vietnam War protest in the 1960s. Quite frequent over there. And the reason a lot of people would, would, would know of Grosvenor Square became ingrained in popular culture. So we are going to cut along here. I think it's the Upper Brook Street. It's got to be, the, I think Brook Street. I don't know if Brook Street does relate to the Tyburn, actually. I think it might be probably Lord Brook. I can't remember. That's not today's walk. <laughs> Just a bit of incident, I think. So we're going to cut through here to High Park. And that is where the, uh, the monument I want to visit is. One corner of Hyde Park. Yeah, I've never been here before. I think my dad will like this. Well, I mean, he might not, but hopefully, hopefully he watches the videos. Dad, you're going to like this. This isn't the monument I was heading for, but this is incredibly poignant and actually quite touching memorial here to the animals at war. And it says here engraved on the stone, they had no choice, particularly in the First World War. It's quite, um, wow quite powerful. It says this monument is dedicated to all the animals that served and died alongside British and Allied forces in wars and campaigns throughout time. Ah, uh, Hyde Park. Smell of horses along here. The monument we're going for is at the far end of this walk. Looks like they're setting up Santa Land here in Hyde Park. That'll be full of people very soon. I think Hyde Park, it's easy as a Londoner to overlook just how magnificent Hyde Park actually is. It's an enormous open space and it's just fantastic all year round. The colours this time of year are beautiful. So I need to find this monument, this memorial. It has particular special family significance on this particular day. Somewhere here near Admiralty Arch on the Hyde Park corner. Let's see if we can find it. I think it's over there somewhere amongst all those other monuments and memorials. There's a statue of Wellington. It, it's, hmm. More difficult to find than I thought it would be. That's the Wellington Arch. It's quite a grand old slab, isn't it? I, I imagine of Portland stone. And the monument that's the focal point of this walk today is over there in that corner. Quite a small one, but a very significant one. Well, to my family story anyway. And here it is, the monument erected to commemorate the glorious heroes of the machine gun corps who fell in the Great War. My grandfather, my paternal grandfather, William Rogers, fought in the machine gun corps in the First World War. Thankfully, he didn't fall, he didn't die in battle. He was injured on numerous occasions, shot in the legs, which was the fate of a lot of machine gunners, due to the fact that was the part of their body that was exposed. And uh, yeah, this is quite poignant. Right. Granddad Rogers, my dad's dad, signed up, volunteered for the army when he was working in a coal mine up north somewhere. I think it was in Castleford. He's from Woburn Green, Buckinghamshire, where I was born, where my dad was born, where my family have lived for about 500 years at least. And he was up there working in a mine because there was no work in, in Buckinghamshire at that time. There was a lot of unemployment and he had a relative up there. So he went there, worked in a mine, then signed up for the King's Own Scottish Borderers. And at some point, I think during his basic training at Edinburgh Castle, he was attached to the machine gun corps. And it was with the machine gun corps that he fought during the First World War. And that due to the, the way that the machine gunners were deployed 
in the First World War, usually in the very at the, fr at the front, in fr front of the front line taking on the enemy because of the power of the Vickers machine guns. They sustained ridiculous casualty rates. I think it was something like a 30% casualty rate, and they became known as the Suicide Club. So my grandfather's survival, really, <laughs> which leads to me even existing, is a little bit of a lottery that he even survived the First World War, met my nan, had my dad in the 1930s, and then I was born, obviously significantly after that. But I hadn't, I didn't know about this memorial until I saw a photograph from the protest yesterday and somebody had climbed the memorial, and that's a statue, I think it's of David there, nothing to do with the machine gun corps, I don't think, and draped a flag around that. And I saw it in the caption, I thought, wow, that's, um, that's interesting. So they draped a Palestinian flag around the, the statue. I think, I'm not sure if it was around the machine guns. And one of my grandfather's battle honors, I think actually it might have been his first one, was at the Battle of Gaza. He served in Gaza, I think, in 1916 and 1917. Of course, I don't need to tell you <laughs> the significance of that at the moment. I never actually got to meet Grandfather Rogers because he died about two weeks after I was born, sadly. But my dad always says he was a quiet man. Didn't speak a lot, he was a quiet man. And when you think about the, the way that the machine gunners had to operate during the war, you can kind of understand why. Well, thanks for coming on that stroll with me through a, a quirky journey through part of central London to a poignant memorial. I'm really glad I came here today. I just sent my, old, my dad a, a picture of it. I knew he said my old man then. So I've got, I'm on BBC Radio London in about 40 minutes and I'm at Hyde Park Corner. I've got to go back there to Great Portland Street. Should be all right. That's the, this, is the, this is the eye they put the special cream on. Is it that different to the other one? Can you see a difference? That one, that one, that one, that one. I think I'm going to stick with my usual facial cream. Anyway, thanks so much for joining me. Buy my book. You see, got to get in there. I've, I've, I've lost the skillful patch. I'm just literally saying, buy my book. <laughs> Uh, there'll be links below to where you can get it from. Signed copies. New and Bookshop. Flox Books in Leighton. Wanstead Bookshop. An event on the 5th of December in Earl's Court. At some point I'll publicise that on social media in here. And hopefully more events elsewhere. Um, still to go, but it's going remarkably well. Anyway, I'm not going to go on about that. That's not the whole point of this. Um, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk. Wherever that may be. B. Take care.